Ever since the 1950s, our food supply has progressively become more processed. This means that the food is essentially more refined and the value, that is the nutritional value, of the food is actually significantly more impoverished. For the most part, the effect of processing really stabilizes the food for a long shelf life and the only way to do that is to really render the food extremely poor in quality. And consequently, we're left with an impoverished food supply and an inability, for the most part, to understand what foods are actually nutritious and what foods aren't. So we need to be more judicious about the kinds of food that we shop for and the kinds of food we bring back to the home base to feed our children and to feed ourselves. So we are left with multicolored, synthetic looking foods that are high in taste sensation, that look good, that taste really good, but for the most part are really not good for us. So in this particular set of lectures, we're going to discern uh, what exactly we need to be looking for on the Nutrition Facts panels. One thing we see with the new Nutrition Facts panel is that the calories and the serving size are much bolder, more visible to the consumer. Let's take a look at the content. So total fat at 2% of the daily value, that's 1.5 grams, uh, can be considered in the following way. First, because it's less than 5%, we can say that it's low in fat. And also, according to uh, the guidelines for labeling by the FDA, because it's less than 3 grams of fat, we can say that it's actually low in fat. Let's drop down a little bit, go down to sodium at 300 milligrams, 13% of the daily value. What exactly does this mean? Well, this is what it means. If the daily value for sodium is 2300 milligrams and the quantity is 300 milligrams, then 300 divided by 2300 times 100 equals 13%. So the DV for sodium is a good one to remember. Let's take a look at dietary fiber. At 17 grams, let's see how they come up with 61% of the daily value. Here's how the calculation works. The daily value for fiber is 28 grams. It's up from the old Nutrition Facts panel, which was at 25 grams. So now under the new uh, Facts panel, we have a higher uh, requirement for fiber, 28. So if one serving is 17 grams, then what's the percent of the daily value? Well, it's 17 divided by 28 times 100, which is 60.7% or roughly 61% as indicated on the food label. This makes it an excellent source because it's greater than 20% of the daily value. Well, what about total sugar? Well, as you saw in the textbook, there's no official governmental cutoff for total sugar, but there is one for added sugar. It's 10% of the calories. Since the food um, facts panel is based on a 2,000 calorie a day diet, we can actually calculate what the daily value is for added sugar. Now, let's take a look at what the daily value is for sugar. It's 10% of the DRI calories. So the Nutrition Facts panel is based on 2,000 calories. So the added sugar um, daily value is really equal to 10% of 2,000 calories. So that's 0 0.10 times 2,000. And we divide that by 4 calories per gram because we're talking about sugar, of course, which is a carbohydrate. That gives us a daily value of 50 grams per day. So if the label states that there are 12 grams, what's the daily value? 12 divided by 50 times 100, which equals 24%. Let's do one more example using some of the micronutrients that are featured here on the label. So let's use calcium as an example. We could see here that the content without the milk is 30 milligrams and it represents 2% of the daily value. Let's see how that calculation is done. Well first, the daily value for calcium is 1300 milligrams. So if one serving 
it's 30 milligram, then what is the percent of the DV? Well, it's 30 milligrams divided by 1300 milligrams times 100. You get 2.3% and the FDA rounds it to 2%. Now, it's important to recognize that there are ingredients uh, in food that need to be kept low, such as saturated fat, trans fat, cholesterol, sodium, and total sugar, and this is because of their association with disease. Now, total fat is a little unusual because fat is indeed important for good health, especially good quality fat. So in this case, rather than getting fat as low as possible, we want to control fat into moderate levels, maybe a healthy level, and in some cases, even low fat levels. So then ingredients such as saturated fat, total fat and total sugar uh, that are considered high in the nutrition facts panel are those ingredients uh, that have a content for which um, that represents 20% or more of the daily value. In the same way, ingredients that we're not really supposed to be taking high concentrations of that attain 10% uh, all the way up to 19% of the daily value, these ones are considered moderately high. Now, an ingredient for which the concentrations are greater than 5 all the way up to 9.9% .9 of the daily value is considered a healthy concentration. This would apply particularly for things like fat because, of course, we do need to have some fat in the diet, but we don't want the fat to be high. We want it to be at a healthy concentration. So that would be greater than 5 all the way up to 9.9%. .9 so now let's take a look at Cascadian Farm uh, Raisin Bran and let's look at the, um, the feature on the front and we could see that we have a content claim claiming that there's 21 grams of whole grain and that there's 7 grams of fiber. So this is a content claim, not a health claim. As we look at total fat at 1.5 grams, we could see that that represents 2% of the daily value. You remember that an ingredient that is 5% or less is considered low. So for total fat, this would be um, an appropriate, if you will, categorization for someone wanting to have a low fat, but you could still have a healthy fat uh, intake if you were greater than 5% uh, and but less than 10%. And then, of course, moderately high, 10% to 19%, and high uh, for 20% or higher. Now I want to drop down to carbohydrates, looking specifically at total sugar and <clears throat> added sugar. Now we know that added sugar, as previously indicated earlier in this video, uh, has a limit of 10% of the DRI calories. But for total sugar, the FDA has no specific standard. But in the textbook itself, um, I teach that um, NIH data supports the idea that we should be aiming for less than 20% of the DRI calories. So in looking at total sugar at 16 grams, we would be able to assess whether this product is high in sugar, moderately high in sugar, at a healthy level of sugar, or actually low in sugar. So the FDA may not provide us with a cutoff for total sugar, but the NIH data does support the idea that whenever sugar intake, that's total sugar intake, is equal to or greater than 20% of the DRI calories, uh, the quality of the nutrition goes down. So we can use that as our cutoff for total sugar. So that means that uh, 0.20 times 2,000 calories, divide that by 4 calories per gram because, of course, sugar is a carbohydrate, and we end up with 100 grams being the cutoff for a 2,000 calorie diet. So now if the facts panel indicates that there are 16 grams of total sugar uh, per serving, then we could figure out what the percentage of the DV and the percent uh, would be 16 grams over the DV of 100 grams times 100, and that would lead us with 16%. So what does 16% mean? Well, if you remember from a few slides previous, that it's between 10 
essentially and 19.9 so this means it's moderately high in uh, sugar now if we want it to be a healthy amount of sugar acceptable as in it's not moderately high or high it would have to be basically greater than 5% all the way up to 9.9% of the DV. Now it's important to understand here that total sugar is indeed different than added sugar. The total sugar is the sugar content that includes the added sugar as well as the natural sugars found perhaps in fruit for example. So in a, a fruit cocktail that's canned you would have a total sugar that would be different than the added sugar. The total sugar would then be the combination of added sugar that was added into the can by the manufacturer and the sugar naturally found in the actual fruit. So as previously stated, this added sugar is something part of the new uh, nutrition facts panel. So on the left we have the old facts panel and on the right we have the new facts panel. And you can see that there's some major differences. Uh, one of which is that the number of calories are actually highlighted uh, much more on the new facts panel. And also, the serving size is much more visible on the new nutrition facts panel as well. Additionally, if you look closer, um, for the same number of grams or milligrams, we find that for total fat, the percent of the DV is different uh, in the old facts panel compared to the new facts panel we see the same difference for total carbohydrates and we see a difference for dietary fiber additionally the micronutrients featured at the bottom are actually different on the old facts panel compared to the new facts panel so let's take a closer look so now a close look at uh, the fat content on the old uh, panel we see that 8 grams is equal to 12 percent of the daily value and now looking at the new panel that same 8 grams is worth only 10 percent of the daily value. So on the old facts panel the um, daily value for fat was calculated using 30 percent of the DRI calories for a day and of course dividing that by 9 uh, and that gave you the daily value on the old nutrition facts panel. That changed over to 35% of the DRI calories. So there was an upward 5% shift in the percent calories uh, coming from fat, still within the healthy range of 20 to 35, but a notable difference nonetheless. So then this means that 30% of the DRI calories on the old uh, facts panel meant that a daily value was 65 grams and now on the new facts panel 35 percent actually means 78 grams of fat that's the new daily value this is the one to remember now let's take a closer look at the carbohydrates in the new nutrition facts panel in the old panel, 37 grams of carbohydrate equal 12% of the daily value, whereas now on the new facts panel, that same value equals 13% of the daily value. So what actually took place? Well, the daily value in the old um, facts panel was 60% of the DRI calories for carbs, and that got changed by going down to 55% of the DRI calories. Well, what this actually means is that now we've gone from a daily value of 300 grams as a daily value on the all facts panel down to 275 grams uh, for the new facts panel representing 55% of the standard 2000 calorie a day diet. So now if we look at fiber on the old facts panel, we can see that 4 grams is actually equal to 16% of the daily value. But on the new facts panel, we can see that that same value is worth only 14% of the daily value. So let's take a closer look and see what actually changed in terms of daily value. 
So what happened was that on the old fax panel, the daily value for dietary fiber was 25 grams. And in the new fax panel, the daily value went up to 28 grams. So it's very natural then, since the denominator increased from 25 to 28, that the percentage uh, would actually go down. So now this is another item, another daily value to remember, the da daily value for fiber, 28 grams. Now the story behind sodium is that on the old fax panel, the daily value for sodium was 2400 milligrams per day. Currently, the new fax panel uses 2300 milligrams for the daily value for sodium. Okay then, so let's do the calculation. On the old fax panel, we have 1060 milligrams of sodium. Divide that by 2400 and you get 44%. If you take that same value and divide it by 2300, you get 46% as indicated on the right hand um, nutrition fax panel, which is, of course is the new one. Now I want to turn to the front of different products and to look at the various claims that are made uh, on the cover of food products specifically. So let's look at Honey Nut Cheerio. And let's look at the heart and see what is being claimed here. Uh, can help lower cholesterol. Now it sounds like a health claim, but it's not. It's actually a functional claim. The functional claim is about bringing down the blood cholesterol. So its function is to lower blood cholesterol. It intimates that it might be good for your heart, but it actually isn't calling uh, or naming any particular disease. So therefore, it's a functional claim. Let's take a look at old-fashioned oats. The smart for your heart is also a functional claim. Let's also take a look then at uh, the ingredient list specifically. We can see that there is total fat that is 2.5 grams, so it's less than three. Saturated fat is less than one, no trans fats. Polyunsaturated, zero for cholesterol, zero for sodium. And then we have dietary fiber, which is four grams, 16% of the daily value. So it's actually a good source of dietary fiber. So if you look at the total sugar, it's actually zero grams. So all the criteria that we've seen here actually comes within the guidelines for what the government considers a healthy food. In fact, the total fats under three grams, cholesterol is less than 20, the sodium is less than 140, sugar is at zero and we also have as you can see um, for um, for fiber 16 percent of the daily value and for iron 10 percent of the daily value so we have at least one nutrient that is providing uh, at least 10 percent of the daily value making it a good source uh, for that nutrient so therefore, because there's really no sugar and there's absolutely no sodium and there's nothing added in, this product is the best cereal on the market. The thing to particularly pay attention to is the ingredient list just right at the bottom. And you can see that it's actually 100% whole grain and there's nothing else added, no salt, no sugar of any kind. So if rolled oats are the first ideal breakfast cereal for adults and children, what's the second one? Well, probably a fiber one. If you remember, the sodium content was low and there was absolutely no sugar. So this comes in second position. Of course, the fiber is exceedingly high as well. Now, when it comes to uh, products in general, uh, something needs to be said about the ingredient list specifically. So I'm talking about ingredient lists in general when we talk about products. And the important thing to walk away with here is that ingredients are listed in descending order of weighted importance. In other words, in this example, wheat bran is weighs more in content than sugar and more than psyllium. So as wheat, as we look at this, wheat is first in importance in terms of weight. Sugar is in second. Psyllium is in third. Um, and salt is actually in fourth and downward all the way down to BHT for freshness. I want to now address the different types of health claims that could be made on the label of different food products. 
So now an outright health claim could be made on the label of a food product if it identifies a substance, whether it's a food, a food component, or a dietary ingredient of some, co of some kind, and that this um, ingredient uh, has a direct effect in decreasing the risk of a specifically named disease. So for example, uh, the intake of soluble fiber uh, can help decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, the intake of insoluble fiber can help decrease the risk of gastrointestinal diseases. These are two very good examples that basically illustrate the specific feature of a health claim. So a health claim is in fact an authoritative statement of a very clear um, health benefit that has strong scientific backing. In other words, there's a lot of evidence scientifically in the literature that supports the claim that's being advanced. So here's an example of an authoritative health claim. This particular product will help reduce the risk of heart disease. So we have the product named and we also have a decrease in the risk of an identifiable disease, notably heart disease. And this kind of claim can only be made on a label if there is authoritative research, significant research, uh, and commonly accepted research, if you will, uh, that supports the finding. In previous slides, we saw examples of a content claim. It has on the label the content of a nutrient nicely featured with no link to any kind of disease, right? And no link to any structure or function claim as well. It simply states that the product is high in folate, for example. Here's an example of a label uh, that contains a content claim. It only states here that there's a lot of fiber. How much? 65% of the daily value. The next kind of claim is called the structure function claim. It describes a function, not a disease, not an improvement in disease. It will actually improve the immunity, for example, or it will strengthen the bones, or it will provide gastrointestinal health. But note that it's not tying itself with any kind of disease condition. And that's one of the requirements for a structure function claim. Here's an example of a structure function claim. This label says, will help strengthen your body's defense system. So it's not naming any kind of disease. It's not promising the reduction of risk of disease. It's simply saying that it's going to uh, change the function, if you will, or strengthen the function of the immune system. This is a good example of a structure function claim. Here are a few more examples of structure function claims. For example, a food may help to strengthen bones. Doesn't state a disease specifically, doesn't state osteoporosis, doesn't state rickets. It just talks about the strengthening of the structure of the bone. Help reduce cholesterol. Well, that's actually a function. It will reduce the cholesterol, but it doesn't say it's going to reduce heart disease, right? And so that's why it gets the structure function claim. It may actually help boost the immunity. Well, that's just really a function of the body that gets helped, but it doesn't talk about any immunological disease specifically. So this is why these are good examples of structure function claims. And finally, there's the qualified health claim. This is a health claim with a qualifying statement. And the statement indicates that the evidence supporting the claim is limited. It generally means that there's no real consensus among the scientific community supporting the particular health benefit. Here's an example of a qualified health claim. Olive oil for your heart and the FDA's disclaimer Qualified Health Claim for Coronary Artery Disease Risk Reduction. So it's basically saying, consumer beware, the relationship between heart disease and actual olive oil is weak. There's no strong consensus.
In order to get a better understanding of how to read a food label in terms of deciding whether or not a food is an excellent source of a nutrient, a good source of a nutrient, not a good source of a nutrient, or a poor source of a nutrient, uh, these of course are nutrients that you want to have maximally in your diet, uh, then I encourage you to go back to chapter two and to look specifically at the section on uh, food labels. Well, as a means of brief summary, certainly uh, when a nutrient is 20% or greater than the DV, it's an excellent source of that uh, vitamin or mineral. A good source is between 10 and 19%, and a poor source is 5% or less. A, not a good source, in other words, equivocal, is between 5 and 9.9%. .9%.